First of all, I want to uh, thank Voiceless uh, for the invitation to speak in this year's Voiceless lecture series. Um, but I also want to say, as an Australian who cares deeply about animal welfare, welfare uh, I want to thank Voiceless for all the work that you do and have done uh, over the last 10 years and all the work that is still to do. So thank you. Um, um, I also want to say something about the hazard of giving the title for a quick speech before you've written the speech, because I'm not sure there's an absolute match between what I'm going to say and the title that was provided, but I think the match is reasonable enough. Um, it's of course a really great pleasure and honour too uh, to provide the locally sourced entree for tonight before we all dine on the sumptuous main course of the presentation that's going to come from Will Potter. I admire Will as a journalist, I think he's doing very brave and important work and Will, along with many others, I want to welcome you to Australia. And I want to share some local knowledge with you. I want to tell you something about Australians. I want to tell you honestly, Will, and from the heart, that I believe that most Australians love animals. We really do. We love animals. Almost two-thirds of Australians have an animal living in their house. Now, yes, sometimes they are mistreated, but often actually they're treated with great love and devotion. We also love animals in their natural habitats. In 2011-12, uh, nearly three quarters of Australian adults had some contact out of choice with animals in nature. Almost three quarters of a million of us do voluntary work every year, uh, voluntary conservation work every year. Our love of animals, their wildness, their otherness, their beauty, their energy, it emerges in all sorts of weird and wonderful ways. And this is the moment when I want to introduce you to Lily. This is Lily. Now, Lily, as you may see, is a little skink that has been visiting the flyer wire of the back door of our small rented place just up the road in the inner west to eat insects for about the last six months. Now, my youngest daughter, Rachel, is 18 months old, and she can't say lizard, but she can say lily. And Rachel loves her lily, and she often notices that lily is there on the back door before any of the rest of us have noticed that lily is there. Rachel loves her lily, as so many of us love animals. We genuinely do. But the sad thing, and the thing that we know we wouldn't be here this evening, is that there is a fearful disconnect. And there is this fearful disconnect because whilst a majority of us love animals and love nature, we know that collectively we are allowing terrible things to happen to animals and to nature in our country, in our society. And it's arising from this reality that I want to address just three key points in my brief uh, uh, entree for you this evening. Now, the first of these is that, in my view, the legal and political project of protecting animal welfare must involve engaging with the destruction and degradation of the natural environment as a form of institutionalised animal cruelty. The second point I want to make is that, in Australia, the law as we know it now is utterly inadequate for protecting the natural environment and the wild animals that live there. And the third thing I want to address is that with the law inadequate, campaigning and peaceful protest becomes the last available option. But our opponents, as Manny has al already uh, inferred, are now trying to criminalise these activities. So back to my first point, the destruction of the natural environment is a form of institutionalised animal cruelty. So when a forest is cleared, or when the ocean is subject to industrialised fishing. These are large-scale processes, but they are processes that involve inevitably the mass suffering and deaths of individual animals, and often quite incidental to the economic purpose of the activity. These are not things that are intended as the commercial industrial fishing takes place. Now, the same applies to climate change. In addition to the severe consequences that we know humanity faces by runaway global warming if we can't restrict global emissions, the science also clearly predicts the mass suffering and deaths of individual animals, as well as the extinction of whole species as a result of climate change. Now, mostly, we have to recognise that this slaughter occurs out of sight and out of mind. 
But for 40 years, it's been the role of Greenpeace to bear witness to the carnage of the natural world as it takes place across the globe. The term rainforest is a generic term, but what that video shows uh, with all its horrible clarity is that there is the individual suffering of every animal which is hurt and killed as a consequence of the clearing of a rainforest. And this brings me really to the second point that I want to address with you, which is that laws protecting nature and wild animals in Australia are weak and getting weaker. All too often, the environmental laws that we have function to do no more than legitimate development, which by any standard of justice and common sense should not be allowed to proceed. Take, for example, the case of the Laird State Forest in the Gunnedah Basin, just up the road, about six hours out from Sydney. Now, the Laird is home to a whole lot of wonderful creatures. OK, this is the point where we get to look at the koala. Uh, the Laird Forest is koala habitat, um, but it's not only the iconic koala. There are some less well-known species, like the vul uh, some of which are vulnerable and threatened, like this beautiful little uh, squirrel glider. Part of the Laird is one of the few surviving remnants of critically endangered box gum forest anywhere in the world. Um, but believe it or not, Australia's largest coal company, Whitehaven Coal, have obtained all the necessary legal and administrative permissions to cut deep into the Laird Forest in order to dig the Malls Creek coal mine, the biggest open cut coal mine currently under construction anywhere in Australia. And of course, by the way, let's remember at this point that coal is the largest single driver of climate change. So rather than providing any remedy to prevent the construction of Malls Creek and the harm to Laird and its animals on either ecological or climate grounds, instead, what does the system do? It says the devastation is legitimate. Whitehaven have already commenced clearing, including we must infer, we must logically infer the mass slaughter of animals along the way. Well, what about another example? You would think if there was one place that our environmental laws would protect in Australia, it would be this one, the Great Barrier Reef. But earlier this year, as we know, the authorities approved the dredging and dumping within the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area to make way for coal infrastructure. The system is acting to legitimate what should be unthinkable we are being let down by a system of law and government. And those who care about nature and wild animals, the wild animals that live there, are really left with no democratic choice in these circumstances other than campaigning in peaceful protest. So, for example, to go back to the Laird State Forest, more than 130 people have now been arrested peacefully trying to stop the destruction of the forest and to protect its creatures, um, including, you may have seen in the media, a 92-year-old World War II veteran Bill Ryan, who's already been arrested twice standing in front of earth moving equipment. Well, this brings me to my third point. Not content with a system that is already thoroughly stacked in their favour, our opponents are now seeking to criminalise peaceful campaigning and protest. To return to Malls Creek, we know that Whitehaven Cole complained to the police about the presence of peaceful protesters within the Laird State Forest. We know that the New South Wales Police then asked the Department of Forestry to close the forest against peaceful protesters, which they did, saying it was a fire risk. We know that rogue industry groups are putting pressure on governments to criminalise the activities of those who are peacefully standing up for animals and nature. Just last month, Mr Stephen Galilee, the head of the New South Wales Mineral Council, called for increased fines and criminal charges against peaceful activists. I don't know if Mr Galilee thinks that our democracy would be served better if 92-year-old uh, World War II veterans were being locked up for standing in front of bulldozers. Maybe he does. I don't know. And we know that some politicians are already uh, ready to jump at the chance to use law enforcement agencies to spy on peaceful protesters. We're also witnessing attempts to shut down markets-based campaigning. You know the kind of work I mean, where an NGO or a group of citizens puts up a set of measures by which some company is behaving egregiously to do some environmental wrong or some harm to animals or some other unethical conduct. 
Um, unquestionably, these campaigns have been one of the most successful ways in which we've been able to improve protection for animals and for nature. There's a couple of recent examples uh, on these two slides. What we have, though, is a federal government that is seriously considering changing national competition law to criminalise activity of this kind. The lives of countless animals in the wild have been saved as a consequence of this kind of work, yet this is the very activity that some within the federal government are now seeking to make criminal. Still, let's acknowledge that as the situation is becoming more serious in Australia, we still have to keep things in perspective. Um, we read recently the Global Witness Report, which uh, noted uh, with sadness that the killings of people who are defending the environment and land rights around the world are increasing. The rate of such murders are on the rise. And we have to remember how lucky we are to live in a country where our struggle to give voice to the voiceless doesn't come at the risk of our lives. We should acknowledge that. Nonetheless, as Manny has said, and I've just uh, 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 set out a little myself, there are worrying trends in this country, in Australia, of governments being prepared to criminalise peaceful campaign activity. And that is why I'm very, very pleased that Will Potter is here in Australia as the guest of Voiceless to give us a sober warning about the direction that our society might take if we are not vigilant. So, let me conclude. I think we have to remain both confident and determined. Let's remember. Let's remember the only reason that the Great Barrier Reef wasn't drilled for oil in the 1970s is because a coalition of concerned citizens stood up and said that that was not going to happen to our Great Barrier Reef. Let's rejoice that this is the first summer in more than 100 years when there will not be whaling ships on the Southern Ocean. We must be confident that history is on our side, but we also have to be determined to make it so. We must be determined that the voiceless shall have their voice. Thank you very much.